Lecture 3 Harmony between the individual and the collectivity Yesterday, we considered man as an individual. There are different aspects to an individual's personality, different levels of needs for an individual in order to develop a complete personality. To satisfy the needs progressively but simultaneously at all levels, certain specific kinds of efforts are needed. These efforts are called Purushartha. These two were considered. But man does not exist merely as individual. The individual comprising body, mind, intellect and soul is not limited to a singular I but is also inseparably related to the plural we. Therefore, we must also think of the group or the society. Theories about the society It is a simple truth that society is a group of men. But how did society come into being? Many views have been put forward by philosophers. Those propounded in the West and on which the Western socio-political structure is based can be broadly summarized as Society is a group of individuals who, having entered into an agreement among themselves, brought it into being. This view is known as the social contract theory. Individual is given greater importance in this view. If there are any differences in the Western views, these pertain only to the questions namely, if the individual produced a society, then in whom does the residual power remain vested? In the society or the individual? Does the individual have the right to change the society? Can the society impose a variety of regulations on the individual and claim a right to the allegiance of the individual to itself? Or is the individual free in regard to these questions? Individual versus Society There is a controversy in the West on this question. Some have advocated the supremacy of the society and from this a conflict has arisen. The view that individuals have brought the society into being is fundamentally incorrect. This is it true that society is composed of a number of individuals, yet it is not created by the individuals, nor does it come into being by the mere coming together of a number of individuals. In our view, society is self-born. Like an individual, society comes into existence in an organic way. People do not produce society. It is not a sort of club or some joint stock company or a registered cooperative society. In reality, society is an entity with its own self, its own life. It is a sovereign being like an individual. It is an organic entity. We have not accepted the view that society is some arbitrary association. It has its own life. Society too has its body, mind, intellect and the soul. Some Western psychologists are beginning to accept this truth. McDougall has propounded a new branch of psychology called group mind. He has accepted that the group has its own mind, its own psychology its own methods of thinking and action. A group has its feelings too. These are not exactly similar to the individual's feeling. Group feelings cannot be considered a mere arithmetical addition of individual feeling. Group strength too is not a mere sum of individual strength. The intellect, emotions, energies and strength of a group are fundamentally different from those of an individual. Therefore, at times it is experienced that even a weakling, despite his individual weak physique, turns out to be a heroic member of the society. Sometimes an individual may be ready to put up with an affront to his personal self, but is unwilling to tolerate an insult to his society. A person may be ready to forgive and forget a personal abuse to him, but the same man loses his temper if you abuse his society. It is possible that a person who is of a high character in his personal life is unscrupulous as a member of society. 
Similarly, an individual can be good in his social life but cannot be so in his personal life. This is a very important point. If we analyze this situation, we shall discover that the modes of thinking of an individual and of a society are not always the same. These two do not bear an arithmetic relation. If a thousand good men gather together, it cannot be said for certain that they think similarly for good things. Collective Mentality An average Indian student at present is a mild and meek young man. Compared to an average student of 20 years ago, he is weaker and milder in every way. But when a score of such students get together, the situation becomes different. Then they indulge in all sorts of irresponsible actions. Thus, a single student appears disciplined, but a group of students become indisciplined. We shall have to consider why this change comes about. This is known as mob mentality, as distinct from individual mentality. This mob mentality is a small aspect of mind. When a group of persons collect for a short time, the collective mentality obtained in that group is known as mob mentality. But society and social mentality evolve over a much longer period. There is a thesis that when people live together in a group for a long time, then by historical tradition and association, and also by continued intercourse, they begin to think similarly and have similar customs. It is true that some uniformity is brought about by staying together. Friendship arises between two persons of similar inclination. However, a nation or a society does not spring up from mere cohabitation. Why Mighty Nations of Antiquity Perished It is known that some ancient nations disappeared. The ancient Greek nation came to an end. Similarly, Egyptian civilization disappeared. Babylonian and Syrian civilizations are a matter of history. Scythians are perished. Was there ever a time when the citizens of those no nations stopped living together? It was only the fact that there were wide differences among the people that led to the downfall for the nations. Greece in the past produced Alexander and Herodotus, Ulysses and Aristotle, Socrates and Plato, and the present-day Greece is inhabited by people of the same hereditary stock. There was no interruption in their heredity because there never was a time when the whole of Greece was devoid of human population and when a new race inhabited that country. Such a thing never happened. Father and son tradition of old Greece was never interrupted. It is possible to trace the ancestry of the present-day Greeks to the old Greeks of some 250 to 500 generations back. Despite all this, the old Greek nation is non-existent. So also, the old Egyptian nation is no longer here. New nations have arisen in those places. How did this happen? The simple fact is indisputable that nations do not come into existence by mere cohabitation. There was never a time in the lives of the citizens of these decadent nations when they stopped living in a group. On the other hand, Israeli Jews lived for centuries with other peoples scattered far and wide, yet they did not lose their identity in the societies in which they lived. It is clear, therefore, that the source of national feeling is not in staying on a particular piece of land, but in something else. What is a nation? That source is in the goal which is put before the people. When a group of persons live with a goal, an ideal, a mission, and look upon a particular piece of land as motherland, this group constitutes a nation. If either of the two, an ideal and a motherland, is not there, then there is no nation. There is a self in the body, the essence of the individual. Upon the severance of this relation with the body, a person is said to die. Similarly, there is this idea, ideal, 
or fundamental principle of a nation, its soul. Although it is believed that man takes birth again and again, yet the reborn person is a different individual. They are treated as two separate beings. The same soul leaves one body and enters another, but the former and the latter are two different individuals. The end of a person is nothing but the departure of his soul from his body. The other components of the body also undergo change. From childhood to old age, there is a drastic change. The biologists tell us that in the course of a few years, every cell of our body is replaced by a new one. A variety of changes take place. Because the soul resides in the body without interruption, the body continues its existence. Such a relation is known as the law of identity in logic. It is due to this identity that we admit the continued existence of an entity. In this connection, a nice illustration of a barber's razor is sometimes advanced. Once while shaving a customer, a barber prided in his razor being 60 years old. His father too had worked with the same razor. The customer was surprised, especially because the handle was quite shiny and new in appearance. Why is the handle so shiny? How have you preserved the brightness for 60 years? he asked. The barber too was amused with this. Is it possible to preserve the handle in a brand new appearance for 60 years? It has been replaced only 6 months ago, he replied. Naturally, the customer was curious and asked how old is the blade? 3 years was the reply. In brief, the handle was replaced, the blade was also replaced, but the razor remained old. Its identity was intact. Similarly, a nation too has a soul. There is a technical name for it. In the principles and policies adopted by the Bharatiya Janasang, this name is mentioned. The word is Chitti. According to McDougall, it is the innate nature of a group. Every group of persons has an innate nature. Similarly, every society has an innate nature which is inborn and is not the result of historical circumstances. A human being is born with a soul. Human personality, soul and character are all distinct from one another. Personality results from a cumulative effect of all the actions, thoughts and impressions of an individual. But the soul is unaffected by this history. Similarly, national culture is continuously modified and enlarged by historic reasons and circumstances. Culture does include all those things which, by the association, endeavors, and the history of the society, have come to be held as good and commendable, but these are not added on to the chitti. Chitti is fundamental and is central to the nation from its very beginning. Chitti determines the direction in which the nation is to advance culturally. Whatever is in accordance with Chitti is included in culture. Chitti, Culture, Dharma By way of an illustration, consider the story of the Mahabharata. The Kauravas were defeated and the Pandavas had won. Why did we hold the conduct of the Pandavas as Dharma? Or why was this battle not considered as just a battle for a kingdom? The praise for Yudhishthira and dishonor heaped on Duryodhana are not a result of political causes. Krishna killed his uncle Kansa, the established king of the times. Instead of branding this as a revolt, we consider Krishna as an avatar of God and Kansa as an asura. Rama was assisted in his invasion of Lanka by Vibhishana, brother of Ravana. Such conduct of Vibhishana, instead of being branded as treason, is considered good and exemplary. He betrayed his brother and his king, even as Jaichand had done later on. He might be branded as a quisling, but Vibhishana is not called quisling by anyone. On the contrary, he is praised highly for his conduct and Ravana's actions are disapproved. Why is this so? The reason behind this is not political. 
If there is any standard for determining the merits and demerits of a particular action, it is this chitti. Whatever is in accordance with our nature or chitti is approved and added on to the culture. These things are to be cultivated. Whatever is against chitti is discarded as perversion, undesirable and is to be avoided. Chitti is the touchstone on which each action, each attitude is tested and determined to be acceptable or otherwise. Chitti is the soul of the nation. It is on the foundation of this Chitti that a nation arises and becomes strong and virile. And it is this Chitti that is manifested in the action of every great man of a nation. An individual is also an instrument in bringing forth the soul of the nation's Chitti. Thus, apart from his own self, an individual also represents his nation. Not only that, but he also mans the various institutions that are created for the fulfillment of the national goal. Therefore, he represents these two. The groups larger than the nation, such as mankind, are also represented by him. In short, an individual has a multitude of aspects, but they are not conflicting. There is a cooperation, unity and harmony in them. A system based on the recognition of this mutually complementary nature of the different ideals of mankind, their essential harmony, a system which devises laws, which removes disharmony and enhances their mutual usefulness and cooperation alone can bring peace and happiness to mankind and can ensure steady development. Institution a means to fulfill national needs. According to Darwin's theory, living beings develop various organs as per the requirements dictated by the circumstances. In our Shastras, it was stated slightly differently that the soul constructs, using the strength of prana, various organs as the need is felt for the purpose of continuing life. Just as the soul produced these different organs in the body, so also in the nation, many different organs are produced as instruments to achieve national goals. Like various departments in a factory, such as buildings, machinery, sales, production, maintenance, etc., nations also produce different departments which are called institutions. These institutions are created to fulfill the need of the nation, family, castes, guilds, which are also known as trade unions, etc., are such institutions. Property and marriage are also institutions. Formerly, there were no marriages. Later on, some rishi established this practice of marriage. Similarly, Gurukul and Rishikul were institutions. In the same way, the state is also an institution. The nation creates it. A lot of trouble in the West is due to the fact that they confused the state with the nation. They considered the state to be synonymous with the nation. Truly speaking, nation and state are not the same. In our country, the state was produced as per the social contract theory. Formerly, there was no state or king. The Mahabharata describes that in Krita Yuga, there was no state or king. Society was sustained and protected mutually by practicing dharma. State and Society Later on, interruption and disorganization set in, greed and anger dominated. Dharma was on the decline and the rule of might is right prevailed. The rishis were perturbed over the developments. They all went to Brahma to seek counsel. Brahma gave them a treatise on the law and functions of the state, which he himself had written. At the same time, he asked Manu to become the first king. Manu declined, saying that a king will have to punish other persons, put them in jail and so on. He was not prepared to commit all these sins. Thereupon, Brahma said, Your actions in the capacity of a king will not constitute sin as long as they are aimed at securing conditions under which the society can live peacefully and according to dharma. This will be your duty, your dharma. Not only that, 
but you will also have a share of the karma of your subjects, whereby you will gain dharma considerably if your subjects maintain conduct according to dharma. Although it is not explicitly stated here, I believe that if the society under any king committed a sin, a part of that too must automatically go to the account of the king. It is not proper if only good things are shared by the king and not the bad ones. Both must be shared in the same proportion. Thus, the state came into existence as a contract. This contract theory can be applied to the state, but not to the nation. In the West, it was exactly opposite. Society as a nation, according to them, was a contract, but the king claimed a divine right and proclaimed himself the sole representative of God. This is wrong. In our country, the king may have been first recognized in antiquity, but the society as a nation is considered self-born. The state is only an institution. Multiple Group Loyalties Similarly, other institutions like the state are created from time to time as the need is felt. Every individual is a limb of one or more of these institutions. A person is a member of his family as well as his community. He may also be a member of some association of his fellow professionals, if he pursues a profession. Above all, he is a member of the nation and society. If we consider even the larger sphere, he is a member of the whole of mankind and then the entire universe. Truly speaking, an individual is not merely a single entity, but a plural entity. He is a part of not just one, but a number of institutions. He lives a variety of lives. Most important is that, despite this multiple personality, he can and should behave in a way which does not bring different aspects of his life into a mutual conflict, but which is mutually sustaining, complementary and unifying. This quality is inherent in man. A person who uses this quality properly becomes happy. On the other hand, one who does not do so reaps unhappiness. Such a person will not have a balanced development in life. As an illustration, a man is the son of his mother, a husband of his wife, a brother of his sister, and the father of his son. A single individual is a father and also a son. He is a brother and also a husband. He has to maintain all these relations with intelligence, understanding and tact. Where a person fails to do so, there is conflict. If he sides with one party, the other feels wronged. The conflict between his wife and his sister, his wife and his mother, result from his inability to behave properly. Thereupon, some of his relations are strained. He is pained because his duties towards his mother and towards his wife clash. When he can resolve this conflict and fulfill all his obligations properly, it can be said that his development will be integrated. We do not accept the view that there is any permanent and inevitable conflict among the multidimensional personality of an individual and different institutions of society. If a conflict does exist, it is a sign of decadence, perversion and not of a nature or culture. The error in Western thinking lies in the fact that some people there believe that human progress is a result of this fundamental conflict. Therefore, they consider the conflict between individual and the society as a natural occurrence and on the same basis they also theorized on the inevitability of class conflict. Evolutions of Varna System Classes do exist in a society. Here too, there were castes, but we had never accepted conflict between one caste and another as a fundamental concept underlying it. The four castes, according to our conception, are thought of as analogous to the various limbs of Virat Purusha. It was suggested that the Brahmins were created from the head of the Virat Purusha the Kshatriyas from his hands, the Vaishyas from the abdomen, and the Shudras from his legs. If we analyze this concept, we are faced with the question of whether there can arise any conflict between the head 
arms, stomachs and legs of the same Virat Purusha. If conflict is fundamental, the body cannot be maintained. There cannot be any conflict in the different parts of the same body. On the contrary, one man prevails. The limbs are not complementary to one another, but even further, there is individual unity. There is a complete identity of interests, identity of belonging. The origin of the caste system was on the above basis, and if this idea is not kept alive, the castes, instead of being complementary, can produce conflict. But then this is a distortion. It is not a systematic arrangement. Rather, there is a lack of any plan, any arrangement. This is indeed the present condition of our society. This process of deterioration can set in the various institutions of a society due to a variety of reasons. If the soul of the society weakens, then all the different limbs of the society will grow feeble and ineffective. Any particular institution may be rendered useless or even harmful. Besides, the need and the usefulness of any particular institution may change with time, place or circumstances. While examining the present state of an institution, we ought at the same time to think of what it should be like. Mutual complementarity and a sense of unity alone can be the standard of proper conduct. Family, community, trade union, gram panchayat, janapada, state and such other institutions are various limbs of the nation and even of mankind. They are independent, mutually complementary. There should be a sense of unity through all of them. For this very reason, there should be a tendency towards mutual accommodation in them, instead of conflict or opposition. State is not supreme. The state is one of the several institutions, an important one, but it is not above all others. One of the major reasons for the problems of the present day world is that almost everyone thinks of the state to be synonymous with society. At least in practice, they consider the state as the sole representative of the society. Other institutions have declined in their effectiveness, while the state has become dominant to such an extent that all the powers are gradually being centralized in the state. We had not considered the state to be the sole representative of our nation. Our national life continued in uninterruptedly even after the state went into the hands of foreigners. The Persian nation came to an end with their loss of independence. In our country, there were foreign rulers now and then in various parts of the country. At some time, the Pathans seized the throne of Delhi, and then the Turks, the Mughals, and the British too established their rule. Despite all this, our national life went on, because the state was not its centre. If we had considered the state as the centre, we would have been finished as a nation long time ago. In some tales for children, it is described how an evil spirit resided in a parrot and to kill the evil spirit, one had to kill the parrot. Those nations whose life is centered in the state were finished with the end of the state. On the other hand, the, where state was not believed central to its life, the nation survived and transfer of political power did not affect it. This had its bad effects also. The late Dr. Ambedkar had said, that our Gram Panchayats were so strong that we neglected the throne of Delhi. We did not remain alert as regards the state, as much as we ought to have done, thinking that nation's life did not depend on the state. We forgot that, though it may be central, the state is definitely an important institution, serving some needs of the nation like a limb to the body. It is possible to pluck a hair without much harm. But along with the hair, if some skin is also removed, and a little further, if the head too is cut off, then there will be great loss for the body. Therefore, the body must be protected, although the various limbs of the body are not absolutely indispensable, yet each of them serves an important purpose.
From the same standpoint, state too should have been deemed important in the life of the nation. There were persons who paid attention to this aspect. It was for this reason that the great teacher of Shivaji, Samartha Ramda Swami, directed him to establish his kingdom. Dharma wields its own power. Dharma is important in life. Sri Ramadas would as well have preached to Shivaji to become a mendicant and spread dharma following his own example. But on the contrary, he inspired Shivaji to extend his rule because state too is an important institution of society. However, to consider something important is different from saying that it is supreme. The state is not supreme. The question arises then, that if state is not of fundamental importance, what is it that is absolutely important? Let us consider this question. Dharma sustains the society. We shall have to examine the reasons why the state was established. No one will dispute that the state must have some specific aim, some ideal. Then this aim or ideal must be considered of highest importance rather than the state which is created to fulfill this ideal. As a watchman is not deemed greater than the treasure he is supposed to protect, so is the case with the treasurer. The state is brought into existence to protect the nation and to produce and maintain conditions in which the ideals of the nation can be translated into reality. The ideals of the nation constitute chitti which is analogous to the soul of an individual. It requires some effort to comprehend chitti. The laws that help manifest and maintain chitti of a nation are termed dharma of that nation. Hence, it is this dharma that is supreme. Dharma is the repository of the nation's soul. If dharma is destroyed, the nation perishes. Anyone who abandons dharma betrays the nation. Dharma is not confined to temples or mosques. Worship of God is only a part of dharma. Dharma is much wider. In the past, temples had served as an effective medium to educate people in their dharma. However, just as schools themselves do not constitute knowledge, so also temples do not constitute dharma. A child may attend school regularly and yet may remain uneducated. So also, it is possible that a person may visit a temple or mosque without a break and yet he may not know his dharma. To attend a temple or mosque constitutes a part of a religion, sect, creed, but not necessarily dharma. Many misconceptions have originated from faulty English translations and the most harmful of them is due to the confusion of dharma with religion. Dharma and religion are different. On the one hand, we used the word religion as synonymous with dharma, and on the other hand, increasing ignorance, neglect of our society and dharma, and greater acceptance of European life became the outstanding features of our education. As a result, all the characteristics of a narrow religion, especially as practiced in the West, were attributed automatically to the concept of dharma also. Since in the West, injustice and atrocities were perpetrated and bitter conflicts and battles were fought in the name of religion, all these were listed en bloc on the debit side of the dharma. We felt that in the name of dharma also battles were fought. However, battles of religion and battles of dharma are two different things. Religion means a creed or a sect. It does not mean dharma. Dharma is a very wide concept. It is concerned with all the aspects of life. It sustains society. Even further, it sustains the whole world. That which sustains is dharma. The fundamental principles of dharma are eternal and universal. Yet their implementation may differ according to time, place and circumstances. It is a fact that a human being requires food for maintaining his body. However, what a particular person should eat 
in how much quantity and what intervals. All these are decided according to circumstances. It is possible at times that even fasting is advisable. If a typhoid patient is given normal food, the consequences may be disastrous. For such a person, keeping away from food is necessary. Similarly, the principles of dharma have to be adapted to changing times and place. Some rules are temporary and others are valid for longer periods. There are some rules regulating our conduct at this meeting. One of the rules is that I speak to you and you listen to me with attention. If in contravention of this rule, you start conversing with one another or addressing the gathering at the same time, then there will be disorder, our work will not progress, the meeting will not be sustained. It can be said that you have not observed your dharma. Thus, it is your dharma that we observe the rules by which the meeting proceeds smoothly. But this rule is applicable only as long as this meeting lasts. If the meeting is over and you do not speak even after reaching home, a different problem will crop up. Your family might have to call in a doctor. It is essential to observe the rules of the home once you reach there. The complete treatise of the rules in general and their philosophical basis constitute what we mean by dharma. These rules cannot be arbitrary. They should be such as to sustain and further the existence and progress of the entity which they serve. At the same time, they should be in agreement with and supplementary to the larger framework of dharma of which they form a part. For instance, when we form a registered society, we have the right to frame the rules and regulations, but these cannot be contradictory to the constitution of the society. The constitution itself cannot violate the society's registration act. The act has to be within the provision of the constitution of the country. In other words, the constitution of the country is a fundamental document which governs the formulation of all acts in the country. In Germany, the constitution is known as the basic law. Constitution cannot be arbitrary. Is the constitution too not subject to some principles of a more fundamental nature? Or is it a product of an arbitrary decisions of a constituent assembly? On serious consideration, it will be clear that even the constitution has to follow certain basic principles of nature. The constitution is for sustaining the nation. Instead, if it is instrumental in its deterioration, then it must be pronounced improper. It must be amended. The amendment is also not solely dependent on majority opinion. Nowadays, the majority is much talked of. Is the majority capable of doing anything and everything? Is the action of the majority always just proper? No. In the West, the king used to be the sovereign. Thereafter, when royalty was deprived of its so-called divine rights, sovereignty was proclaimed to be with the people. Here in our country, neither the kings, nor the people, nor the parliament have had absolute sovereignty. Parliament cannot legislate arbitrarily. It is said about the British parliament that it is sovereign and cannot do anything. They say that British parliament can do everything except make a woman a man or vice versa. But is it impossible for the parliament to legislate that every Englishman must walk on his head? It is not possible. Can they pass an act that everyone in England must present himself before the local authority once every day? They cannot. England has no written constitution. They have high regards for their tradition. But their traditions too have undergone change. What is the basis of making changes in their traditions? Whichever tradition proved to be an obstacle in the progress of England was discarded. Those which were helpful in the progress were consolidated. Traditions are respected everywhere, just as in England. We have a written constitution, but 
Even this written constitution cannot go contrary to the traditions of this country. In as much as it does go contrary to our traditions, it is not fulfilling dharma. That constitution which sustains the nation is in tune with dharma. Dharma sustains the nation. Hence, we have always given prime importance to dharma which is considered sovereign. All other entities, institutions or authorities derive their power from dharma and are subordinate to it. We need a unitary constitution. If we examine our constitution from the point of view of the growth of the nation, we find that our constitution needs amendment. We are one nation, one people. That is why we did not entertain any special rights on the basis of language, province, caste, religion, etc., but gave everyone equal citizenship. There are separate states, yet there is no separate citizenship of state and of union. We are all citizens of Bharat. By the same token, we have denied the right to secede to any individual state. Not only that, the power to demarcate the boundaries of states and choose. Not only that, the power to demarcate the boundaries of states and to choose their names is vested in Parliament and not in the assemblies. This is as it should be in tune with the nationalism and traditions of Bharat. However, despite all this, we made our constitution federal, whereby what we have adopted in practice, we have rejected in principle. In a federation, its constituent units have their own sovereignty. But these powers are given to the union. It has no power of its own. Thus, the federal constitution considers the individual states as fundamental powers and the center is merely a federation of states. This is contrary to the truth. It runs counter to the unity and indivisibility of Bharat. There is no recognition of the idea of Bharat Mata, our sacred motherland, as enshrined in the hearts of our people. According to the first para of the constitution, India, that is Bharat, will be a federation of states, that is Bihar Mata, Banga Mata, Punjab Mata, Kannada Mata, Tamil Mata, are all put together to make Bharat Mata. This is ridiculous. We have thought of the provinces as limbs of Bharat Mata and not as individual mothers. Therefore, our constitution should be unitary instead of federal. Decentralization of power A unitary state does not mean concentration of all powers in the center. Just as the head of the family does not have all the powers with him, even though all the transactions are carried out in his name. Others also share the executive powers. In our body also, does the soul possess all powers? Thus, a unitary state does not mean a highly autocratic center nor does it entail the elimination of provinces. The provinces will have various executive powers. Even the various entities below the provincial level, such as the Janapadas, will have suitable powers. The panchayats had a very important position. Nobody could dissolve panchayats. Today, however, our constitution does not have any place for these panchayats. There are no powers with these panchayats in their own right. They exist at the mercy of the states only as a delegated authorities. It is necessary that their powers be considered fundamental. In this way, the decentralization of power will be accomplished. The authority will be distributed to the lowest level and will be fully decentralized. At the same time, all those entities of power will be centered around the unitary state. This arrangement will embody dharma. If we carry this concept of dharma even further, not only the state and the nation, but the nature of the whole of mankind will have to be considered. In other words, the constitution of a nation cannot be contrary to the natural laws. There are a number of norms of behavior which are not found in any statute book, 
yet they do exist. At times, they are even stronger and more binding than any statutory law. The percept that one should respect one's parents is not written in any law. The present-day governments, which are turning out varieties of laws, day in and day out, have not passed a law to this effect. Still, people respect their parents. Those who do not are criticized. If tomorrow there arises a discussion, even in a court, it will be generally accepted that as long as a person does not attain majority, he should accept his parents' decision. Dharma means innate law. Thus, the fundamental law of human nature is the standard for deciding the propriety of behavior in various situations. We have termed this very law as dharma. The nearest equivalent English term for dharma can be innate law, which, however, does not express the full meaning of dharma. Since dharma is supreme, our ideal of the state has been dharma rajya. The king is supposed to protect dharma. In olden times, at the coronation ceremony, the king used to recite three times, there is no authority which can punish me. A similar claim was made by kings in the western countries, that is, it was said, king can do no wrong, and hence, there too, nobody could punish the king. Upon this, the Purohit used to strike the king on his back with a staff saying, No, you are subject to the rule of dharma, you are not sovereign. The king used to run around the sacred fire and the Purohit would follow him, striking him with the staff. Thus, after completing three rounds, the ceremony would come to an end. Thereby, the king was unambiguously told that he was not an unpunishable sovereign. Dharma was above him, that is, even he was subject to dharma. Can people do whatever they please? It may be contended that democracy means just that. The people can do what they please, but in our country, even if people wish, they are not free to act contrary to dharma. Once, a priest was asked, If God is omnipotent, he can act contrary to dharma, can he not? If he cannot, he is not omnipotent. This was a dilemma. Can God practice a dharma, or is he not omnipotent? Actually, God cannot act contrary to dharma. If he does, then he is not omnipotent. A dharma is a characteristic of weakness, not of strength. If fire, instead of emitting heat, dies out, it is no longer strong. Strength lies not in unrestrained behavior, but in well-regulated action. Therefore, God, who is omnipotent, is also self-regulated and, consequently, fully in tune with dharma. God descends in human body to destroy a dharma and re-establish dharma, not to act on passing whims and fancies. Hence, even God, who can do everything, cannot act contrary to dharma. But at the risk of being misunderstood, one can easily say that dharma is even greater than God. The universe is sustained because he acts according to dharma. The king was supposed to be a symbol of Vishnu in as much as he was the chief protector of dharma rajya. Dharma rajya is not a theocracy. Dharma rajya does not mean a theocratic state. Let us be very clear on this point. Where a particular sect and its prophet or guru rule supreme, that is a theocratic state. All the rights are enjoyed by the followers of this particular sect. Others either cannot live in that country or at best enjoy a slave-like secondary citizen status. The Holy Roman Empire had this basis. The same concept was existing behind Khilafat. Muslim kings the world over used to rule in the name of Khalifa. After the First World War, this came to an end. Now efforts are afoot to revive it. Pakistan is the most recent theocratic state. They call themselves an Islamic state. 
There, apart from Muslims, all the rest are second-class citizens. Apart from this difference, there is no other sign of Islam in Pakistan's administration. The Quran, Masjid, Rosa, Eid, Namaz, etc. are the same in both Bharat as well as Pakistan. There is no need to tie up state and religion. By such a tie-up, there is no increase in an individual's capacity to worship God. The only result is that the state deviates from its duty. This does not happen in Dharma Rajya. Rather, there is freedom to worship according to one's own religion. In a theocratic state, one religion has all the rights and advantages and there are direct or indirect restrictions on all other religions. Dharma Rajya accepts the importance of religion for peace, happiness and progress of an individual. Therefore, the state has the responsibility to maintain an atmosphere in which every individual can follow the religion of his choice and live in peace. The freedom to follow one's own religion necessarily requires tolerance for other religions. We know that every kind of freedom has its inherent limits. I have the freedom to swing my hand, but as soon as there is a conflict between my hand and someone else's nose, my freedom has to be restricted. I have no freedom to swing my hand so as to hit another person's nose. Where another person's freedom is likely to be encroached upon, my freedom ends. The freedom of both parties has to be ensured. Similarly, every religion has the freedom to exist, but this freedom extends only as far as it does not encroach upon the religion of others. If such encroachment is carried on, it will have to be condemned as misuse of freedom and will have to be ended. Such limitations will be required in all aspects of life. Dharma Rajya ensures religious freedom and is not a theocratic state. Secular State of Fallacy Nowadays, the word secular state is being used as opposed to a theocratic state. The adoption of this word is a mere imitation of the Western thought pattern. We had no need to import it. We called it a secular state to contrast it with Pakistan. There is some misunderstanding arising out of this. Religion was equated with dharma and then secular state was meant to be the state without dharma. Some said ours is a nidharmi state, nidharmi meaning without dharma. Whereas Others are trying to find a better sounding word, called it dharma nirpiksh, which means indifferent to dharma. But all these words are fundamentally erroneous. For a state can neither be without dharma, nor can it be indifferent to dharma, just as the fire cannot be without heat. If fire loses heat, it does not remain fire any longer. A state which exists fundamentally to maintain dharma to maintain law and order can neither be nidharmi nor dharma nirpeksh. If it is nidharmi, it will be lawless state and where there is lawlessness, where is the question of the existence of any state? In other words, the concept of dharma nirpeksh and state are self-contradictory. State can only be dharma rajya and nothing else. Any other definition will go against the very raison d'etre of the state. Legislature versus Judiciary In a Dharma Rajya, the state is not absolutely powerful. It is subject to Dharma. We have always vested sovereignty in Dharma. Presently, there has arisen a controversy. Whether the parliament is sovereign or the supreme court and whether the legislature has higher or the judiciary has higher powers. This is like a quarrel as to whether the left hand is more important or the right hand. Both are the limbs of the state, the legislature as well as judiciary. Both have distinct functions to perform. In their individual sphere, each is supreme. To consider either one of the above would be a mistake. Yet, the legislators say, we are higher. On the other hand, members of the judiciary assert that they have a higher authority since they interpret the laws which the legislature makes. 
the legislature claims to have given powers to the judiciary. If necessary, the legislature can change the constitution. Hence, it claims sovereignty. Now, since powers are bestowed by the constitution, they are talking of amendments to the constitution. But I believe that even if by a majority of constitution is amended, it will be against dharma. In reality, both the legislature and the judiciary are on equal plane. Neither the legislature is higher nor the judiciary. Dharma is higher than both. The legislature will have to act according to dharma. And the judiciary too will have to act according to dharma. Dharma will specify the limits of both. The legislature, the judiciary or the people, none of these is supreme. Some will say, why? People are sovereign, they elect. But even the people are not sovereign, because people too have no right to act against dharma. If an elected government allows people to go against dharma and does not punish them, then that government is in reality a government of thieves. Even the general will cannot go against dharma. Imagine what will be the situation if by some maneuvering thieves gain a majority in the government and send one of their ranks as the head of executive. What will be the duty of the minority if the majority is of the thieves and elects a thief to rule? The duty clearly will be to remove the representative elected by the majority. Majority is not always right. During the Second World War, when Hitler attacked France, the French army could not stall the onward march of the Nazi troops. The then Prime Minister of France, Marshal Pétain, decided to surrender. The French public supported the decision. But de Gaulle escaped to London where he declared that he did not accept the surrender. France is independent and will remain so. From London, he formed a government of France in exile and eventually liberated France. Now, if the majority rule is to be considered supreme, then de Gaulle's actions will have to be condemned. He had no right to fight in the name of independence. De Gaulle derived his right from the fact that the French nation was above the majority public opinion. The national dharma is above all. Independence is dharma for every nation. It is the duty of every citizen to preserve its independence and to strive for regaining it when it's lost. Even in our country, a majority had not risen against the British, only a few had. Some revolutionaries sprang up, some brave people stood and fought. The Lokmanya Tilak declared, Freedom is my birthright. He did not declare this birthright with the support of a majority or a referendum from the people. Nowadays, people advocate that the merger of Goa should be decided by referendum, that there should be a plebiscite in Kashmir, etc., etc. This is wrong. National unity is our dharma. A decision concerning this cannot be made by plebiscite. This type of a decision has already been taken by nature. Elections and majority can only decide as to who will form the government. The truth cannot be decided by the majority. What the government will do will be decided by dharma. You all know that in the USA, where Americans swear by democracy, Lincoln did not accept the wrong public opinion on the question of the abolition of slavery. When the southern states declared their intention to secede, Lincoln stood firm and told them, you have no right to secede, even in a democracy. He fought against this and did not allow them to secede. Nor did he tolerate slavery. He did not show readiness for a compromise whereby there might continue partial slavery to accommodate southern states. He did not favor the policy of compromise. He categorically declared that the system of slavery is against tradition, the dharma, the principles which were the basis of the American nation. Therefore, the system of slavery had to be abolished. When the southerners decided to secede, he told them, you cannot secede. On this point, there was a civil war and Lincoln did not compromise with Adharma. 
Here in our country, the situation in this regard is very much like the old Hindu marriage, where a married couple could not divorce even if the both parties wished. The principle was that their behavior should be regulated not by their sweet will but by dharma. The same is the case with the nation. If the four million people of Kashmir say that they want to secede, if the people of Goa say they want to secede, or some say they want the Portuguese to return, all this is against dharma. Of the four fifty million people of India, even if all but one opt for something which is against dharma, this does not become the truth. On the other hand, even if one person stands for something which is according to dharma that constitutes the truth, because truth resides with dharma, it is the duty of this one person that he treats the path of truth and changes people. It is from this basis that a person derives the right to proceed according to dharma. Let us understand very clearly that dharma is not necessarily with the majority or with the people. Dharma is eternal. Therefore, it is not enough to say, while defining democracy, that it is the government of the people. It has to be a government for the good of the people. What constitutes the good of the people? It is dharma alone which can decide. Therefore, a democratic government, Janarajya, must be rooted in dharma, that is, dharmarajya. In definition of democracy is Government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Of stands for independence, by stands for democracy, and for indicates dharma. Therefore, there is true democracy only where there is freedom as well as dharma. Dharma Raja encompasses all these concepts. Delivered on 24th April 1965.